Chapter Three of Makers of Many Things by Eva March Tappan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three. Kid Gloves. There is an old proverb which says, "For a good glove, Spain must dress the leather, France must cut it, and England must sew it." Many pairs of most excellent gloves have never seen any one of these countries, but the moral of the proverb remains, namely, that it takes considerable work and care to make a really good glove. The first gloves made in the United States were of thick buckskin, for there was much heavy work to be done in the forest and on the land. The skin was tanned in Indian fashion by rubbing into the flesh side the brains of the deer, though how the Indians ever thought of using them is a mystery. Later, the white folk tried to tan with pig's brains, but however valuable the brains of a pig may be to himself, they do not contain the properties of soda ash, which made those of the deer useful for this purpose. And here's a photograph of cutting hides into gloves. The caption says, "The hides are kept in racks, and before cutting are stretched by hand. Then the steel die cuts out the shape of the glove. Notice the curiously shaped cut." For the thumb. Years ago, when a man set out to manufacture gloves, usually only a few dozen pairs, he cut out a pattern from a shingle or a piece of pasteboard, laid it upon a skin, marked around it, and cut it out with shears. Pencils were not common, but the glove maker was fully equal to making his own. He melted some lead, ran it into a crack in the kitchen floor, and cracks were plentiful. And then used this plummet, as it was called, for a marker. After cutting the large piece for the front and back of the glove, he cut out from the scraps remaining the fourchettes, or forks, that is, the narrow strips that make the sides of the fingers. Smaller scraps were put in to welt the seams, and all this went off in great bundles to farmhouses to be sewed by the farmers' wives and daughters for the earning of pin money. If the gloves were to be the most genteel members of the buckskin race, there was added to the bundle a skein of silk, with which a slender vine was to be worked on the back of the hand. The sewing was done with a needle three-sided at the point, and a stout waxed thread was used. A needle of this sort went in more easily than a round one, but even then it was rather wearisome to push it through three thicknesses of stout buckskin. Moreover, if the sewer happened to take hold of the needle too near the point, the sharp edges were likely to make little cuts in her fingers. After a while, sewing machines were invented and factories were built, and now, in a single county of the state of New York, many thousand people are at work making various kinds of leather coverings for their own hands and those of other folk. Better methods of tanning have been discovered, and many sorts of leather are now used, especially for the heavier gloves. Deer are not so common as they used to be, and a buckskin glove is quite likely to have been made of the hide of a cow or a horse. Kid generally comes from the body of a sheep instead of that of a young goat. Our best real kid skin comes from a certain part of France, where the climate seems to be just suited to the young kids. There is plenty of the food that they like, and what is fully as important, they receive the best of care. It is said that to produce the very finest kidskin, the kids are fed on nothing but milk, are treated with the utmost gentleness, and are kept in coops or pens carefully made, so that there shall be nothing to scratch their tender skins. Glove makers are always on the lookout for new kinds of material, and when, not many years ago, there came from Arabia with a shipment of mocha coffee two bales of an unknown sort of skin, they were eager to try it. It tanned well and made a glove that has been a favorite from the first. The skin was found to come from a sheep living in Arabia, Abyssinia, and near the headwaters of the River Nile. It was named Mocha from the coffee with which it came, and Mocha it has been ever since. The suede glove has a surface much like that of the Mocha. Its name came from Swede, because the Swedes were the first to use the skin with the outside in. Most of our thinner kid gloves are made of lambskin, but dressing the skins is now done so skillfully in this country that homemade gloves are in many respects fully as good as the imported, 
Indeed, some judges declare that in shape and stitching certain grades are better. When sheepskins and lambskins come to market from a distance, they are salted. They have to be soaked in water, all bits of flesh scraped off, and the hair removed, generally by the use of lime. After another washing they are put into alum and salt for a few minutes, and after washing this off they are dried, stretched, and then are ready for the softening. Nothing has been found that will soften the skins so perfectly as a mixture of flour, salt, and the yolk of eggs, custard, as the workmen call it. The custard and the skins are tumbled together into a great iron drum, which revolves till the custard has been absorbed, and the skins are soft and yielding. Now they are stretched one way and another, and wet so thoroughly that they lose all the alum and salt that may be left, and also much of the custard. Now comes dyeing. The skin is laid upon a table, smooth side up, and brushed over several times with the colouring matter. Very lightly, however, for if the colouring goes through the leather, the hands of the customers may be stained, and they will buy no more gloves of that make. The skins are now moistened and rolled, and left for several weeks to season. When they are unrolled, the whole skin is soft and pliable. It is thick, however, and no one who is not an expert can thin it properly. The process is called mooning, because the knife used is shaped like a crescent moon. It is flat, its centre is cut out, and the outer edge is sharpened. Over the inner curve is a handle. The skin is hung on a pole, and the expert workman draws the mooning knife down it until any bit of dried flesh remaining has been removed, and the skin is of the same thickness, or rather thinness, throughout. All this slow, careful work is needed to prepare the skin for cutting out the glove, and now it goes to the cutter. There is no longer any cutting out of gloves with shears and pasteboard patterns, but there is a quick way and a slow way nevertheless. The man who cuts in the quick way, the block cutter, as he is called, spreads out the skin on a big block made by bolting together planks of wood, with the grain running up and down. He places a die in the shape of the glove upon the leather, gives one blow with a heavy maul, and the glove is cut out. This answers very well for the cheaper and coarser gloves, but to cut fine gloves is quite a different matter. This needs skill, and it is said that no man can do good table-cutting who has not had at least three years' experience, and even then he may not be able to do really first-class work. He dampens the skin— stretches it first one way and then the other, and examines it closely for flaws or scratches or weak places. He must put on his die in such a way as to get two pairs of ordinary gloves, or one pair of elbow gloves, out of the skin, if possible, and yet he must avoid the poor places if there are any. No glove manufacturer can afford to employ an unskilled or careless cutter, for he will waste much more than his wages amount to. There used to be one die for the right hand, and another for the left, and it was some time before it occurred to any one that the same die would cut both gloves, if only the skin was turned over. And here's a photograph of Closing the Glove. The caption says, When sewing time comes, the glove goes from hand to hand down the workroom, each stitcher doing a certain seam or seams. Here's another photo called where the glove gets its shape, and the caption says, After inspection the glove goes to a row of men who fit it on a steam-heated brass hand, giving it its final shape and finish. Now comes the sewing. Count the pieces in a glove, and this will give some idea of the work needed to sew them together. Notice that the fourchettes are sewed together on the wrong side, the other seams on the right side, and that the tiny bits of facing and lining are hemmed down by hand. Notice that two of the fingers have only one fourchette, while the others have two fourchettes each. Notice how neatly the ends of the fingers are finished, with never an end of thread left on the right side. The embroidery must be in exactly the right place, and it must be fastened firmly at both ends. This embroidery is not a meaningless fashion, for the lines make the hand look much more slender and of a better shape. Sewing in the thumbs needs special care and skill. 
there must be no puckering, and the seam must not be so tightly drawn as to leave a red line on the hand when the glove is taken off. No one person does all the sewing on a glove. It must pass through a number of hands, each doing a little. Even after all the care that is given it, a glove is a shapeless thing when it comes from the sewing machines. It is now carried to a room where stands a long table with a rather startling row of brass hands of different sizes stretching up from it. These are heated, the gloves are drawn upon them, and in a moment they have shape and finish and are ready to be inspected and sold. The glove is so closely associated with the hand and with the person to whom the hand belongs that in olden times it was looked upon as representing him. When, for instance, a fair could not be opened without the presence of some noble, it was enough if he sent his glove to represent him. To throw down one's glove before a man was to challenge him to a combat. At the coronation of Queen Elizabeth, as of many other sovereigns of England, the Queen's champion, a knight in full armour, rode into the great hall and threw down his glove, crying, "'If there be any manner of man that will say and maintain that our sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth, is not the rightful and undoubted inheritrix to the imperial crown of this realm of England, I say he lieth like a false traitor, and therefore I cast him my gage.'" End of chapter 3 Read in March 2011 in San Diego, California.